I just pretty much refused to let the Vietnam War identify me. You know, I mean, it was an experience, an experience I had no control over. All I could do is experience and go on, and that's pretty much what I did. My name is Lyle Bowes, and I was a Sergeant E-5 in the U.S. Army, served in Vietnam. The reason why I was in Vietnam was because I started college, and as they were all, we were all told, you know, if you're going to amount to anything, you should go to college. Raised on a farm. And I started college, and I was in there for three months, and I didn't, I never liked school. School was easy for me. It was actually kind of boring, and I never really liked it. But I knew that if I didn't go to college, I was going to be drafted and go to Vietnam. So I sat in college for three months, and I looked out the window one day, and the sun was shining in, and I thought, what in the world am I doing here? And I lived my whole life growing up outside, and, uh, you know, I was, I was very good in math, but I wanted to be outside, and I only thing I could think of as math is I was either going to be an engineer or a, an accountant, and I couldn't. I didn't want to be either one, so uh, I just chose to go volunteer for the draft because I knew if I didn't, if I went and got a job and started with my life, I was 18 years old, uh, they would draft me out of, away from my job anyway, so just well get this thing over with. And at that time, I never really understood what all was going on in Vietnam. And at that time, it wasn't near as severe as it got after I got there. Gene Murphy. We met the night, I, the afternoon I got on the bus in Brookings, South Dakota, where I live now. And we came to the induction station where we were inducted into the military, uh, took our oath, and we spent the day filling out our papers, getting shots and getting our clothes, military issue, uh, for three, four days. And then we got taken to our basic training station. And. Uh, so they, the second day we were there, they made me a squad leader in the platoon. Then they needed a, what they called a weapons guide, somebody to take care of the rifles and the bayonets. So I talked them into giving Gene that job. So then he was in my squad bay room with me. So we spent basic training in the same room together. And uh, then after we got out of there, they took us to the advanced infantry training. And then he got put on the uh, top bunk there, and I got put on the bottom bunk. And so we spent every day there, too. And we spent every day together, except when we came home on leave after training. We had a 15-day leave, and uh, Gene went to White and I went to DeSmet to our homes and so we didn't see each other during excuse me we did meet each other's families during that leave and then we both met down in the airport here in Sioux Falls our parents brought us down to get on the plane to fly back to Fort Lewis where we were leaving for Vietnam. Our, order, we, our name was on the same, on the same set of orders, and uh, which that just followed us all the way through. I mean, it, we got to Vietnam, we were at Cameron Bay, and then we orders, we waited for two days for our orders to come down to see where we were going, and we both were on the same set of orders to go to 4th Infantry Division 
and uh, got to the 4th Infantry Division, and then they sent us to the same battalion and the same company, and and uh, so then we we got our weapons and our jungle gear and everything at that company area. Then they put us on a truck, and uh, I think we went to what they call the trains area, which is, I think, is the same area that Gene was taken to after he was wounded. So they trucked us out to the trains area, and we were there for about two days, and then they put us on this Huey chopper, and they flew us out to the field, and uh, when they landed, we landed in a little, Whenever we stopped, whenever our company stopped, we'd have to find a place where we could cut the jungle down to make a landing, LZ, a landing zone. And this landing zone was cut, the bamboo was cut down. And so the bamboo was only about 18 to two feet tall, 18 inches to two feet. And I got out of that chopper well, we were hanging out, there's no doors on it. You rode on it with your feet hanging out of the chopper all the time. <clears throat> we landed there and I got out of there and I looked up the little bitty hill, not much of a hill. I looked around and I seen this, what we call a little hooch. We'd take our shelter halves and snap them together and put, cut a tree and build a tent. And we call it a hooch. And I looked up there and I could see about the top half of one of them hooches. And I thought to myself, oh no, because I knew where I was going to be for the next year. And I thought, we are in a lot of trouble here. <laughs> and so that's, that's how we got to the jungle of Vietnam and then we didn't come out of the jungle. I came out of the jungle out of 12 months, I spent 10 and a half months in the jungle. I got to go on R&R, &R, and we had stand downs a couple times, but you know, it took me a week or week and a half to get to the jungle. It took me a few days to get back. But other than that, it was 10 and a half months in the jungle, on guard 24 hours a day, very little water, very little food, never took your clothes off. It, that was, it was, and you were, you didn't know what was going to happen. Any morning you got up, you got up and you, we had our work to do, you know, whether the whole company was moving or a four-man patrol was moving. You had no idea what that day was going to be. You had no idea if you were going to get into a battle, or if you weren't, but you had a job to do, and if you lost focus on that job, there was a good chance you were gonna be in trouble. And so that's what we did, that was our job, was to patrol the jungles and, and complete the mission. And we were never told what the mission was. We were told, you four guys go there and observe, or your platoon goes there and observe, or the whole company moved. And we went in, and our packs, our gear that we were carrying was about 110 pounds. And uh, so, <laughs> about 100 degrees. And we were in triple canopy, which means that you had the trees, the tall trees, then you had another level of vegetation that was probably not quite as half the height of them trees, and then you had the ground cover that was probably five to six foot high. So you very seldom ever seen the sun. The sun was always out, but you, you were soaking wet all day long every day because if it wasn't raining and you were soaking wet from raining, you were soaking wet from sweating. And so, and you stopped, they, when they brought meals, they brought cases of sea rations. 
there's 12 different meals in a case of sea rations. So that was your choice for three meals a day without of 12. Well, everybody had their favorites when they started out. Well, after about a week of that, then they were getting sick of that. And so, you know, as time went on, you got sick of all of them. And then it became hard to eat because it just did not taste good. And so in the end there, I would <laughs> take and find these sea rations or whatever if we were set up someplace and I would make a stew in my steel pot and dump a whole bunch of sea rations together and stir them up and heat them up in my steel pot and dish them out to the squad and different ones. So, you know, it was a, it was a terrible environment. Snakes, monkeys, hogs, bugs, the kind of bugs there were was, there was centipedes, leeches, mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were so big that they would a attack right through your poncho liners and they just it was <laughs> the jungle is a very harsh environment every plant had a spike on it the trees had depending on the size of the tree they had these spikes sticking out of them that if it was a two inch tree that spike probably stuck out an inch and a half. If it was a three inch tree that spike stuck out by about three, four inches. If it was a six inch tree it was, I mean, so you couldn't lean up against a tree because there were spikes and they had these wait a minute vines, these weeds, they called them wait a minute vines because they were a kind of like a creeping jenny only a little bit bigger stem and all of the the thorns grew down towards the ground. So when you walked through that, it was just ripping at your clothes all the time or your skin. Uh, you know, the snakes, one time we sat down and we were <laughs> taking a break and there was this boa constrictor sit hanging in the tree right above us. We didn't see him until after we sat down. So this boa constrictor was probably about six, eight inches across, you know, and we sat there and we talked about what, should we shoot him or should we not? Or, and we decided not to shoot him because we didn't want to make any noise, you know, because we never knew where we were or who was around. And he didn't do anything. He did not drop down and eat one of us. <laughs> So, I mean, that's, you know, there was cats. We'd never seen much for cats, but they were around. There was rats, you know, the rats we would, if we were someplace where we ate, you know, for a few days, we would dump our sea ration cans in what we called a sump, you know, and burn our, our cardboard and stuff like that that they came out of. And uh, then the rats at night would get in there and rustle around in the cans, you know, trying to eat something out of the cans. And so you had to try to stop that because you didn't want anybody hearing that. So when we moved as a company, when we left where we were, uh, when we first got to the jungle, we, so we all, you have to pack everything you have, everything there has got to be packed up. So you got to take your sleeping gear, your food, your ammunition, your rifle. We, the company squad would have a shovel and a pick, and your water, your steel pot, the radio, machine gun ammo, and everything. And so you get plus all your ammo, plus all your water everything and so it's got to be like around 100 pounds and, and uh, so then you would go and move all day long through the jungle 
if it was thick, some somebody would have to break through them wait a minute vines and the, all the underbrush. And then at night, you come to your night location and you would build the same thing that you left that morning. You would dig your foxhole for three people. You would cut trees down so you could fill your sandbags which you were carrying. And then you would take your trip flares which you were carrying and put them out and you would cut the field of fire you know, probably 40, 50 feet out, cut everything down so if something happened, you could see. And when you got all that done and you got your hooch built, then you'd sit down and you'd heat up a can of sea rations and have your supper or whatever. Then you would go to bed at 9 o'clock from 9 to 6 every night. There's three guys on guard and you would get up three hours and pull guard that night, every night. They would do the same thing at the command center. They would have to watch the radios. They would have, then we'd send three people out on a listening post and they would sit out there in the jungle. They would go past that field of fire that we come down and they would set down probably I would say 75 yards out in front of us, and that was a listening post. And those guys had to sit out there and listen with radio. Every 20 minutes, they would call them and ask for a sit rep. And then if everything was okay, they would hit the squelch button twice. Now when this guy's turn was over, you'd tap the guy next to you, and he would sit up, and then he had to sit there whatever amount of time you had decided. You could do two one and a half hour gigs, three one hour gigs, or one three hour gig. Usually it was two one and a half hour gigs, and you'd sit there. So you'd come out of a sleep, that's whatever kind of sleep you were in, and sit up, and you gotta stay awake, and sit there. And then if you did not answer, when they called you and said, sit rep, if you did not answer, then they'd come out and try to wake us up or something, or, you know, they'd come down and we'll have to figure out first what the deal was, but anyway, it, and you were tired. <laughs> you were tired, because that was how every night was. It didn't matter whether you were out there on LP or sitting on your bunker. You were sitting up three hours out of that nine hours. So that was kind of how we met and then we lived for a year. When Gene got hit, you know, that was, that was the nightmare that we hoped would never happen. And I was leading the company that day. My squad was on point. And we had a, dest a night location, a destination, and, and on we, we traveled on uh, topographical maps all the time, is what. And I had to lead the company to the night location, next night location all geared up. But to go in a straight line meant we had to go up a very steep hill, which I knew we couldn't do because it was rain, it was wet, it was wet time of the year, and so it would be muddy. We couldn't do that, so I had to elect to go around that and you go up the fingers, what we called fingers was, you know, or, and different terrain that you could travel. So I turned and went in the direction that I felt was the best and we ran into steps cut into the hill. And I thought, this isn't good, but I had really no choice. I talked to the captain and we really had no choice so we took the steps 
and went up the hill. Well, we come around this tree, and these guys took off, and I knew we were in trouble. So I called the captain, let him know, and then they we put part of the company on sweep, and they had me go chase this guy that run off with this other group and we got you know then the gunfire started a little bit there was and uh, we got up and I was I went up to find my squad after I had did some organizing here and there and they were they had they had dinks up there with them and I helped them with them and then I ended up back with the captain and the lieutenant. And of course, we were just sitting in a little spot out in the jungle. There was, we hadn't, we had no, we, we would just, this is where we are, on a flat spot. And uh, then the lieutenant said, well, they had, they would, wanted somebody to go make this sweep. And uh, they decided that Gene would take one of his fire teams, each squad had two fire teams, and, and the other squad leader would take his fire team and they would go sweep that area. And they took off. And I stayed there at, and the next thing I know, they call up and say, we've got six WI. I listened to the captain call, talk to a battalion, and. He's got six WI-8. I wow, we do? Yeah, we do. So at that time, I says, I had another one of from my platoon was there, and were two of them. One was an RTO, a radio telephone operator, and the other one was just a line troop. I says, can I go down and help get them out? And they said, yeah, if you want to. And so I said, come on, guys. And we headed down the trail, and uh, there was a trail. We didn't really know what we were into at that time, but we had run into an NVA hospital. And we got down, so I'm going down the trail, and uh, here's his sergeant coming up the trail, and he's got his arm severely wounded. And, I stopped and talked to him, and I said, where are all these WIAs? And he said, down there. And I said, who are they? And he said, you know, he named Murph. Murph. And I said, Gene Murphy? He said, I don't know. It's Murphy. So I knew that was Gene was wounded at that time. So I took off with the two guys and moving down the trail, and I went and followed the trail. And I come to a RTO. I was hiding behind a tree. And I said, where's Murphy? Because he says he's back there. So I'd already went by him. And then, so then I started back, and they were having their gun battle going on up here. So I, noise discipline was not an issue. So I just started hollering Gene's name, Murphy, Murphy. And when I got close enough to him, he hollered at me and said, Bo's over here. And, uh, so then I found him, and I would have never f seen him had he been unconscious, because he was over there in the jungle. <laughs> <clears throat> so I went over there, and and he says, I can't feel my legs. I had no idea how he was wounded. I couldn't see any blood or anything. And so I really didn't know. They had put a patch on him. His wound addressing and, and uh, so we were there and I said, now I got to get him out of here and had no machete but he had I don't know where I come up with the poncho somebody had a poncho so but I I had no machete so I grabbed these two trees there and busted them and made a stretcher out of these two trees and uh, with I, this poncho, so you just take two sticks and snap the poncho together, and then they could, you know, that. 
So I did that, and uh, we picked him up and carried him up out of there, and when we were carrying him up out of there, his lieutenant was shot up and everything. There was six wounded, and we got him up there, and, and uh, of course, then the chopper come in to get him out of there, and, and when he was, he had one guy up in the chopper. I didn't know all this. I've learned all this in the last three years. He had one guy in the chopper and one guy because he had to let a cable down and a jungle penetrator to get him up. And this other guy was 20 feet off the ground. And he says, I've, it's too hot down there. I'll see you in the morning. And of course, that was devastating news for us. Because the first thing, yeah, we know it's hot down here, you know. <laughs> anyway, he took off. And so then, you know, I, I dug that small hole or whatever, a hole as long as Gene would put him down so if we took incoming that he wouldn't get any wounded anymore. But what had happened is while he was loading them, trying to load them two guys on a chopper, he, they, he counted, the next day he counted 360 bullet holes in that chopper. What happened was his, the electrical systems on his chopper were starting to fail, and he had to get out of there. And so he flew to an area probably three-quarters of a mile away that he knew and he sat that chopper down, and he's, of course, he's still got this guy hanging on the string out here. And so he goes out and he sets that chopper down, and then he gets down so far, and then he slides over so he doesn't set on that guy. And he set it down, and the chopper quit. So anyway, we had to go the night. We knew it. And the worst, you know, Gene was hurting, you know, and he wanted water. You know, when you get wounded, you, you go into shock and then you get real thirsty, you know. And, of course, he wanted water. My training was give him a cap full. <laughs> Don't, you can't give him very much because you're afraid if it's infected water that it could infect and make things worse. So, so, so I give him a cap of water every time he'd ask. And uh, anyway, this, this other guy was kind of screaming all night long. And, and had he got out that night, he would have been just fine, my understanding is. He was from Pennsylvania, Psy. But he didn't, he died shortly before the chopper got there, hour maybe. So we laid there and everything, and then when, he, when the next morning came, I went down and told the captain that Gene's first one out. He said, okay. I went back to get him, because the chopper was coming, and got him down there and got him in there and got him up and got him gone, and that's all I could do. So I went back and I was thirsty. I hadn't drank any water because I wasn't going to drink any water till I knew that Gene was okay. He had all the water he needed. And then I reached over and picked up my canteen to get that drink of water because I was the one that laid it back down there. I knew how much water was in that, and there was no water in that. <laughs> oh, I was I was hot, but I, nobody I could. But what you going to do? You just don't have any water and. Over there, I was offered 20 bucks for a quart of water. Can you imagine that in 1969? And I would not sell it. After I put Gene Murphy on a chopper, I knew that I would not know whether he was alive or dead until I heard from home. And so immediately I wrote home to my folks and his folks and told them that Gene had been wounded and uh, 
I think he was going to be okay, you know. And uh, I got a letter back probably two weeks later that told me that Gene had made it. So that was the only way I knew. We never knew, and we go look at records today. You try to look at records. The only records there are are the killed in action, KIAs. That day that we lost all them people, all we know of is the KIAs. They don't have any record of WIAs that day. So that information was, there was no information. But I was sure glad to hear that Gene <laughs> was alive. Three days later, we, had, we, we moved from that position up to the location where I was supposed to end up the night, that, the night before. And then three days later, they decided they're gonna, we're going to take my platoon and go check out the NVA hospital. You know, this is just over the hill. <laughs> and we take off to go check that out, and we run into a machine gunner, right? We hadn't went very far, but we were going up a narrow little finger. And so we ran into a machine gunner, and my machine gunner was laying, he was on the top of the ridge with the company commander and the, and the platoon leader, and they killed uh, our point man right away, and he laid down and he, so I got, now we've got these two machine guns shooting at each other, and uh, so the captain was laying there up there, and we had a forward observer, which was to call in artillery and stuff, and he's up there, and he said, the captain said, okay, when I give the word, we're gonna charge. And the forward observer said, who's gonna charge? <laughs> anyway, it's a sad story. The captain jumps up and is gonna charge, and he gets shot through the heart, drops dead. My lieutenant, had 13 days left before he was coming home. Got all nervous, jumped up, and hollered medic, and got his head blown off. And he fell over the side of the mountain, and I had to go down and get him, and he was straddling a 250-pound dud bomb. So we're having this little gunfight on top of a 250-pound bomb. I ended, at that point, I became top-ranking individual. And so then I pulled everybody off the hill. And uh, tough day, you know, but that's how Gene and I lived. But there again, you know, you just had to do what you were doing, you know. I mean, you had to, you had, you had to stay focused. You know, with all of this carnage, I had a friend. This friend was with me the whole year, and uh, we were going into a wet LZ one day, and it was supposed to be hot. Wet meant how wet? We had no idea how wet. It was wet. You're gonna get your feet wet. We were wet all the time. No big deal. Hot, how hot is it? Is there machine guns going or what? You know, don't know. So we go in and we're ca -ing. That's combat assault. And that's what they called when you went in on a helicopter. And they pull in and, and so we go in there and the helicopter and they take like four or five helicopter loads at a time. And we go in there and the helicopter stops. And I look down and there's this elephant grass, but it looked like grass, you know, just, why isn't this chopper sitting down? And uh, pretty soon, poosh, I get shoved out the helicopter, the 
he, I, I think it was uh, either the pilot or the co-pilot shoved me out. And so I fell into the water and the elephant grass wrapped up in my feet. So I went clear to the bottom on my knees with my pack on and everything. And I thought <laughs> they weren't kidding when they said wet. <laughs> and so I get down, I gather myself up and stand up and the water is up to my shoulders and my neck. And I thought, holy smokes. And I look around and there's this steel pot helmet sticking out of the water behind me. And I thought was, I'll bet he's short of air. And I reached over and I grabbed him and I picked him up. And uh, <laughs> he comes up. And uh, the water's coming down off his helmet and everything, and all he can see is that dirty sons of bitches. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't help but laugh. But anyway, then another friend of mine or another one in my squad come and ha grabbed a hold of him and helped him. And, and uh, he had nowhere to go. I, he was going to stand there and drown if I hadn't seen him. Now, to give you an idea of what it was like, I seen that guy in the late night. Well, it would have been in the in the 2000s, maybe 2002 or 2003. I went to see him in Massachusetts, and he sat there and he says, "Do you remember who saved my life that day? They pulled me out of that water." And I said, that was me. He says, it was you? And I said, yeah. Can you imagine being in a situation that you're going to die and you can't remember who saved you? But it was just those things that just happened. So we went to the shore that time and one of the little antidote. We got to the shore, and that water was plumb full of leeches. So we got in there, and so we're all pulling our pants down and taking our shorts off. We don't have underwear. We just fatigues. And we have cigarettes that we light up to burn the leeches off, because they'll drop off if you touch them with a cigarette. And I often thought, how did we have dry matches and cigarettes <laughs> after jumping into five feet of water. But we did. I just pretty much refused to let the Vietnam War identify me. You know, I mean, it was an experience, an experience I had no control over. All I could do is experience and go on, and that's pretty much what I did, although there's, you know, I mean, when I see Gene hurting like he does, that's probably the toughest time of my life, is, is witnessing that. Well, I think him and bo I both agree that we feel pretty fortunate that we have it. You know, Gene is a guy that when you meet Gene, you want to be his friend forever, and he, anybody that he doesn't know is a friend that he doesn't know, but as soon as he just hasn't met him yet, you know, and that's the way Gene is, and he's, uh, he is a real person. There is no doubt about what Gene is thinking or what he will do, because if there is, ask him. And that's what you will get. And a pretty good rendition, too. <laughs> but it's, you know, I mean, it's, he's my brother, you know, and it's, 
I stop here a lot now, especially when I'm retired and I've got time. I, I stop here quite often because I know where he'll be. He'll be here and then we can sit and give each other a hard time or do whatever, catch up. But uh, matter of fact, that's what happened yesterday. I stopped here and then he said, you were coming and asked if I would come and take part. If Gene wants me to do that, that's what I'll do. It's been a little bit of an up and down thing. When I first come home, you know, when we were over in Vietnam, we would sit around in the jungle. We were in the jungle because that's where, that's the only place we ever were and talk about how when we got home, we would never talk about Vietnam. We didn't want to remember any part of it. And when I got home, I went about two weeks without talking about it. And it was tearing me up. And so I started sharing a little bit of it with my dad. I was real close to my dad. And so as time has went along, I went, we went to Washington, D.C. when the, the one statue that faces the wall, the three guys that face the wall was dedicated by Ronald Reagan. That was a real hard time for me because I looked around and here were all these guys with fatigues on, missing legs, missing arms, and all this stuff. And my life had been, had been good, been successful, you know, I'm, and I hadn't spent any time thinking about it. And I had a guilt trip. I thought, I, I forgot all about these guys. I left these guys. And so I had to spend a little time working through that. A lieutenant was a salesman that stopped one time and asked me how it was going. I told him, I said, I was doing pretty good until I went out there. And he, you know, and he says, have you read any books? And he suggested a book to me that I read and, and it was a big thick book and it was about a about Vietnam and in the jungles of Vietnam. And by the time I was done with that book, I was sick of Vietnam again. So I put it down and then went back to my life. And uh, so it's, you know, and then they, you know, we were, as, as a group, we were not welcomed home. We were baby killers. And uh, there was a group, when they started pulling out of Vietnam, they, were, they brought a group of soldiers home and they marched them down through Seattle for a homecoming and they threw eggs and tomatoes at them. And it didn't matter that they was just those guys out there. It was all of us was out there. And that's, we got eggs and tomatoes. And so we were young, we were strong, and we'd been battled hardened, and we had a chip on our shoulder. And uh, that's how we lived. And, and alcohol was a problem. Marijuana was a problem, you know, uh, probably not as much of a problem as the alcohol, but I think in my, I think half of the carnage of the Vietnam veterans that we suffered after we come home was because of the way we were treated when we got home. And it was a terrible time for the nation. And there was lots of suicides, lots of alcoholism. You know, I even forget the statistics that the mental problems that they were going in to address 
every year for years and years, there was just as many Vietnam veterans going in for treatment as the year before. And so, I have no, personally, I have no guilt feelings because I had no choice in the matter. I had to do what I had to do to survive and help as many survive as I could, and that's what I did. But the trauma of just, you know, the battles were bad. But when you just go and you are hungry all day every day, you're thirsty all day every day, and you're tired all day every day, and you are working hard. It was just that alone was traumatic. <clears throat> well, I asked the question one day, well, I was with, in Gene's town hall meeting up in Brookings, and they were, they had representatives from all the VA hospitals and their legislators. And I said, you know, I said to VA, I said, you guys have got your nice big buildings and you got your nice payroll and everybody's happy. And every once in a while you get together with Gene and his buddies here and you talk about Benny's and all that stuff and it's all real calm. And then I said, uh, I gotta watch the television. And on comes the commercial, Give to the Wounded Warriors. So I said, what, what's the deal there? When do you decide to send them out to the curb? When you get tired of looking at them, or how does that work? And uh, needless to say, I never got an answer. Meeting was over. It is totally unconscionable that our politicians will send our young men into battle and they go out of patriotism and we are a bunch of patriotists and I would go again if I, my freedom was jeopardized. But you know, when they come out and I have sat and listened and they try to figure out a way how not to take care of the veteran rather than figuring out how to take care of the veteran. When that individual is to the point where he needs the type of care that the wounded warriors or the tunnels to towers or whatever need to take over, why is that? Why aren't we making sure that he's taken care of? And so the DAV, uh, Gene Murphy, I don't know what he all told you, but that guy, I used to talk to him, uh, talk to him in the frame of Mr. VA of South Dakota, but I don't do that anymore. He is Mr. VA of the United States of America. I would challenge anyone to bring somebody to me that's did more for the veterans of America than Gene Murphy. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And he has did it without receiving one dime. He's did it out of pure patriotism and love for the veterans. So why can't more of us be like that? Why can't we see that?